The Bible passage is taken from Acts chapter 2, verses 14 to 15, 17, 21, 29 to 39, and 41 to 47. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. prophesy. Young men, your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Fellow Israelites, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried, and his tomb in here to this day tomb is here to this day. But we but he was a prophet and knew that God had promised him and promised him on oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing what was come what was to come, he spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah that he was not abandoned to the realm of the, de the realm of the death nor did his body see decay god has raised this jesus to life and we are all witnesses of it exalted to the right hand of god he has received from the father the promised holy spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear for david did not ascend to heaven and yet he said the Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brother, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to the number that day. They devoted themselves to the apostles, teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who, who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts they broke bread in, the ho in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Thank you, Joel, for reading that passage. Uh, it was a long passage, I know. Um, but um, as much as I thought that we could cut off some verses, I thought every verse um, was really powerful, and I thought we should all read that together. Um, so before I start, I um, just want to start with a small word of prayer. Lord, our Heavenly Father, Spirit of the living God, we believe you are here. Your presence is here, Lord. And you're already moving each one of us here this morning. And 
even as I speak from your word, Lord. Father, I stand here with reverence, knowing that I'm just your voice. And I pray that everything that comes out of my mouth is not that is coming out of my understanding or ability, but words that you want your people to hear today. In Jesus' most precious name, I pray. Amen. Okay. So um, the title of today's message is What Happened? And as you can see, um, you know, you could see an image over there. That's the image of a microscope. Uh, because uh, today we're going to deep, uh, we're going to go deep into uh, what really happened that day because there was a lot of action that happened. And there were two remarkable events that happened as we read that passage, you know. The first event that happened was uh, the Holy Spirit coming down on the believers on the day of Pentecost. And we see that this transcends into Peter who stands and testifies among uh, people who were actually making fun. And they thought that, you know, they were all drunk, but Peter stood up boldly uh, to speak the truth. And then the other remarkable event that happens is that they start with 120 believers, and they end with 3,000 people who were filled with the Holy Spirit. And in between these two remarkable events, there's a lot of action that happened. There's lots that happened. And today we are going to unpack um, what happened um, and how God moved um, through the work of the Holy Spirit. But before I do that, I just have a visual game to play with everyone today. Uh, Kezia, can we have that slide up? Yeah. So, um, you know, when I had COVID, um, um, I craved for something like a chocolate cake. <laughs> but I had no appetite, and it was just a mix of, uh, I didn't have any taste or anything. Uh, so I thought I could just use that uh, to play a game with all of you. So the title says, Guess the Cake. Uh, can anyone guess uh, what are those two pictures here about? Yeah, someone said chocolate cake. Yes, you're right, chocolate cake. But um, what? Layers. OK, that's quite deep, Stephen. <laughs> uh, you know, I know it's a chocolate cake, but can anyone guess which one of these is dark chocolate cake and which one of these is a normal chocolate cake? Someone said, someone said something. Exactly, you have to taste it. Yeah. Can we go to the next slide, Kezia? OK, can anyone guess which drink is this? You know, one of them is actually a mango drink, and one of them is actually an orange drink. And um, just like um, you, know, you yourself said that, unless we taste it, how can we know which one of them is a mango drink or a dark chocolate? And um, when I was going through this period where I had no taste, uh, there's this verse that kept coming to me uh, from Psalm 34, verse 8, which, which says, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. But how can we taste um, whether our Lord is good or not unless and until we experience him? And the experience, the revelation, uh, comes not from anything but the work of the Holy Spirit. And today, uh, that's what we are going to see in detail. So um, as I said, this portion, there's a lot of action that happened. And first, we see Peter. This is the same Peter who had denied Christ when Christ was going to be crucified, uh, who is now uh, standing up uh, in front of people who were making fun. Um, and he was again in a situation where, there, where he had a choice to either deny Christ or stand up for him. But this time, he chose to act differently. This time, he was bold. He was courageous. This time, he didn't care whether he's going to be killed for proclaiming the gospel. Uh, but he just spoke the truth. So if we look at this closely, what was different 
uh, in the Peter who was there when Jesus walked on this earth and in the Peter who is right now after Jesus was resurrected and ascended into heaven. The difference was that at that time, Peter just knew Jesus and his miraculous power. But this time, he was filled with his miraculous power through the Holy Spirit. And so this was Peter not talking about out of his own ability, but he was actually talking with the power of the Spirit of God in, in him. And as we read this passage further, we see that Peter um, is not defending Christ. You know, He's not trying to prove to anyone. He's just speaking what was foretold about Christ, what was told by Christ. And he just keeps that truth right in front of everyone. And we see that when that truth is spoken, when that truth is spoken, when he declares that the Jesus whom they crucified is not just their Messiah, but their Lord, it leads to a miraculous transformation of 3,000 people who are willing, who are openly asking, okay, what shall we do now? And they repent, and they receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So. What happened that led to this miraculous transformation of these 3,000 people? You know, um, if we look at this chapter at a glance, the whole chapter, you know, the entire chapter of Acts chapter 2, we may think that everything happened just suddenly, you know, as a snap. That, you know, there was the Holy Spirit came down upon the people. Uh, but it actually did happen suddenly, you know, Acts chapter uh, 2 verse 2 says that suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the house. But if we look more deeply, it was not sudden. You know, There were a couple of actions that actually led to, to the revival that happened on the day of the Pentecost that day. The very first thing was someone stood up, and that was Peter, who stood up to speak the truth. And what was the truth? He said that um, this that you're seeing is the pouring of the Holy Spirit, which is for everyone, everyone. You know, today as we were worshiping and, you know, even as Arpit said that the word holy, we think that it's, it's, a, it's a word that it's not for us. We are so unworthy that it's not for us. But there was this one remarkable revelation that happened that day that Peter said, it's been prophesied that in the last days, the Holy Spirit will be poured out on everyone. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And today, um, we heard such a powerful testimony from Pinky. I mean, did anyone go and give her the gospel or did anyone go and tell her Jesus is Lord? No. She was in a place where no one knew what is the kingdom of God, what is heaven, what is to be loved. But there was something in her heart that made her call out to the Holy One. And we saw how her life was just changed. So, so there was declaration of Lord, of Jesus as Lord and Messiah that day. And the hearts of people were stirred up. They asked, what shall we do? And they made a choice to repent. And they wanted to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So there, was, there were all of these actions that took place that led to the transformation of those 3,000 believers. And once they received this Holy Spirit, there was a radical shift in the attitude of the believers. The, the people who were termed as crowd were now termed as believers because what was the radical shift? They experienced peace. They experienced righteousness. There was joy between them. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and they broke bread in remembrance of what Christ did for them. Whenever they met, they prayed. They were united together with love 
and they praised God sincerely. So this was a radical shift that happened that couldn't have happened with any man's power. It was the work of the Holy Spirit. And we see that the rad this shift was the manifestation of the Holy Spirit in each one of them that day. And so what does that mean for us today, you know? We may think that that's something that happened 2,000 years ago, and what does that mean for us today? It means that if we really want to be a church that witnesses Christ to the world outside, then there has to be a radical shift within each one of us present here today. And this shift cannot just happen by doing the bare minimum that we would like to do to show ourselves as Christians to the world. The shift can happen only if we are willing to look inwards. We are willing to ask the question, what shall we do? And we are willing to give all our failings, all our messes, all our shortcomings, all our guilt, our sins to Christ, and make way for the Spirit of God residing within us, to reside within us. You know, um, if I look at Wellspring, um, do you know that uh, the Wellspring Sunday service that we all enjoy so beautifully, it's not a one-person show, you know? We have a tech team, the people who are there behind who are not visible. There's a worship team, there's a welcome team, there's someone who comes and gives the community updates, uh, there's someone who shares the, who reads the Bible reading, and then there's each one of you who participate in worshiping this Lord, praying, and just listening from the word of God. So when a church service cannot function without all of us being involved, then how can the church be a witness to the world without every believer really experiencing the living hope in Christ and the work of the Holy Spirit within them? You know, when I was doing my PhD, um, I was working on brain tumor cells. Um, and these are cells that are um, isolated from a patient's brain tumor tissue. So yeah, I did my PhD um, in cancer biology. And, um, and, that, and my research work involved cultivating, you know, growing these cells uh, to a particular number and until I could use them to conduct my experiments. So basically, these cells were the building blocks for my experiment. And if anything, could, anything went wrong, all my experiments would fail. So I had to really take care of them like babies. And they had to be uh, given, they had to be grown in a specific environment, given specific nutrients, and kept in an incubator. Um, you know, this might just seem a little too overwhelming for you. So I have a picture. Uh, for you, Kezia, you can have that slide um, so that it's, yeah. So you see the very first picture on the left. That's an incubator where uh, we actually store our cells. Um, and those dishes that you see is actually called a Petri dish. And uh, every morning, um, I had to come and check these cells and see if they are doing well because only then I could start my experiment. Now, um, if I'm lazy, you know, I'll just open the incubator and just see, okay, all of them look same, all of them look okay, and they're all good. And if I, by mistake, use that cell called cells, and they are not in their good health, my experiment is doomed. So, I had to every day observe each dish under the microscope, even if it looks same. Now, why microscope? Because, Sometimes, though they will look all fine through my naked eyes, but if I would observe them under the microscope, you know, there would be these tiny microorganisms, which I don't want, bacteria, yeast, or fungi, which will be moving on top of my tumor cells. And that would mean my cells are unhealthy. You know, if you can see that picture on the left, um, just below the microscope, which says healthy cell, those are my clean cells. I worked on those cells. If you see a picture on the left, the unhealthy cells, if you look, I don't know if it's zoomed out for you more clearly, 
there are these black elongated particles, that's the bacteria in it. And they'll be moving. And that's when I know that, oh, I can't use this. So all my three days of growing them, giving them food is all gone waste. Um, why did I say this? You know, I, sometimes our Christian life can be like this. It can look all great, perfect from the outside. Uh, when we are with our church community, when we are with our families, with our friends, everything good, all perfect, we're all good. And you know what? We can spend our entire life uh, without looking inwards and just focusing on our outward projection so that we look all perfect and great and acceptable to the world outside. But it's the Spirit of God which convicts us it gives us that microscopic lens, which enables us to identify all those hidden sins, which we so cleverly hide from ourselves and the world outside. And when Jesus was going to be crucified, uh, he promised his disciples that uh, once he's gone, he will send an advocate, which he calls the spirit of truth. And last week we learned that the spirit of truth is a person. It's not a thing to be understood. He's a person to be known. And he's a spirit of truth. And, he, um, and this spirit of truth, um, if you look at the verse John chapter 15, verse 26, there are two versions um, that I'm going to read out. First is the amplified version which says, but when the spirit of, but when the helper, comforter, advocate, intercessor, counselor, strengthener, standby comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, that is the spirit of truth who comes from the Father, he will testify and bear witness about me. You know, when I look at this verse, I can, I can, I immediately relate it to Pinky's life actually. Who testified to her and bore witness? for Jesus. It was the work of the Holy Spirit. And um, the message version says, when the friend, when the friend I plan to send you from the Father comes, the Spirit of Truth issuing from the Father, he will confirm everything about me. He will confirm. We don't have to do anything. And in very simple words, he will make Christ more real to us. Um, you know, we don't really focus on knowing how Christ is more real to us through our everyday life. Um, and um, when I read this verse, uh, it took me back into time. Uh, so three years ago, you, you know, even when the world didn't even know what was quarantine, uh, what was being locked inside, uh, this somewhere in January 2020, when I was doing my postdoctoral research in the U.S., I was diagnosed with tuberculosis. Um, and um, that's a disease where actually you're contagious for almost a month until the antibiotics start working in you. I didn't know that. Um, and I just thought that I probably have asthma because I was just coughing and I had chest pain and all of that. I went to the clinic, they asked me to do an x-ray, and they said, once the reports come, we're going to, uh, we'll tell you what's wrong. And I thought, I mean, I couldn't take leave, so the next day I went to the lab, and I get a call from the clinic, they said, you can't be in the work premises. I said, why? They said, you have TB. I said, but you didn't do any tests, you just saw my x-ray. And they said, you've got TB, you're contagious, you can't be here, you've got to go home right away. And you can't be in contact with anyone. And that means I was staying with my flatmate and she had to move out. And this was, I wasn't there with my family. And the rule over there was that because they want to make sure that I take my meds, so a nurse would come every day at 8 o'clock with 11 to 12 antibiotics to, for me to swallow, which meant I had to eat my food before that so that my body could take that. And uh, it's not like it would be all fine after those medicines. I would feel nauseous. Um, I'll feel like puking, but I had, to, so my doctor told me, you have to eat, I was like 36 kgs at that time. And she said, 
If you don't eat, your body can't cope up with these antibiotics. I was all alone in that it was a big apartment I was in, but all by myself. And there was this one day, I managed to have my breakfast, managed to take my medicines, but I was just so dizzy. I was lying down from 8.30 in the morning till 3 p.m. having no strength. No strength, no will to get up. I didn't want to go and eat. And there was no Swiggy to come and give me food. I had to go get up, go to the kitchen, cook, and eat. And I was really moaning from within me. And I said, I don't want to get up. I can't get up. I can't go make that meal. Why am I even alive? Um, I can't do this. And there's no one I can reach out to, no one whom I can call. I was in a whole different time zone. So uh, I couldn't call anyone and just talk. It was just me alone in that home, all by myself. Who did I have with me? I just had one name to call to, and that was Jesus. And I said, Jesus, I have no strength. And you know, there was this quiet whisper in my heart which, which said, Jason, can you just get up from the bed? Just put your one foot down. And I would do that. And then that voice would say, can you just go till your bedroom door and just go out? And I would go. Then go till the kitchen. And there was this voice constantly instructing me, can you open the fridge? Can you make a soup for yourself? Can you just eat? That was when Christ became real to me. And that was not me. No, no, no. That was not even my knowledge of how much I knew Christ. That was the Spirit of God, and I knew it. And that is how He, the Spirit of God, becomes a reality. And we may think, why do we need the Spirit of God? You know, why do we need it? I mean, um, our life is going all great. Why do we need a supernatural experience? You know, John 6, verse 30, 63 Jesus said to his disciples, the spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you are full of spirit and life. And um, last week we saw there was an amazing visual demonstration of the Holy Spirit which Eric did uh, with Rina's hair dryer, which he saw, you know. It was a small ball, and if you want to keep it, <laughs> it's already, it's out in the open now. <laughs> So it's a small ball, and if you want to keep it up in the air without you using your hands, it was the power of the wind which was with that hair dryer that kept it up in the air. That is the power of the Holy Spirit. You know, it keeps us in place where we cannot stand by our own strength. And on the day of the Pentecost, God sent this Holy Spirit to empower that early church the small group of believers after Jesus' ascension to heaven to carry out the Great Commission. And the effect was immediate and it was impressive. And Peter, who had previously denied knowing Jesus, preached a message that resulted in the salvation of 3,000 people. You know, when Jesus walked on this earth with, with his disciples, for his disciples and the people who saw those miracles, for him, Jesus was just there, there as, a, as their savior. They thought that he's just going to come and rescue them from the hands of the Romans and uh, heal them, comfort them, and make their life more, um, less, uh, with a life with less of struggles, a life of a different kind of freedom that they were looking for. But it is only after... You know, Jesus resurrected. They saw him ascending into heaven. They received the Holy Spirit. Their eyes opened to see that this Jesus was not just their Messiah, but was their Lord. The Lord who is the author and sustainer of everything on earth and in heaven. The Lord who stands to defend the defenseless, avenges justice for those who are denied justice, who comforts those who need comfort, who heals those who are broken within their spirit. That's our Jesus, our Lord. And, you know, we, 
unfortunately we put this jesus in a box thinking that he's there he's just jehovah jaira a provider but he's so much more more than that he's elohim he's almighty he's jehovah nissi he's he's rafa there's so many names to this jesus and he's our lord and you know we may think why do we need this supernatural experience uh, why do we need this divine experience but you know living a life filled with the holy spirit for a believer is not just a supernatural experience it's actually a natural and powerful reality that christ has gifted to each one of us i mean each one of us when i say each one of us even you know a 5 year old kid a 12 year old kid who happens to have that understanding can receive the holy spirit and he has gifted that to us so that we can live a victorious liberated and redeemed life on the earth until we see him face to face one day and spend uh, eternity with him you know the purpose of the holy spirit uh, i know we um there was a message yesterday in our uh, whatsapp group where the post said um, the same power uh, that raised jesus from the dead lives within you so what do you want to do with that power and i'm so glad um, amita replied that uh, to be a witness to jesus you know the the holy spirit that lives within us it was not meant to empower uh, ordinary men and women to look extraordinary to the world no it was meant to empower ordinary men and women to display an extraordinary god to this broken world um we are you know in the last couple of um sermon series there's one thing that stands out in each series is that is to be a witness to jesus to the world outside um and maybe some of us can question why do we need to you know bear witness to christ i mean we can just be happy in our lives have this jesus to ourselves and why do we even need to do that um yesterday um i came to know one of my former um peer in lab uh many years ago her younger sister who's who was in her early 20s she committed suicide and why she just didn't know what to do with her life it was a she was hopeless and uh, i immediately looked into the statistics of the number of suicides that we have in the world today you know and as per who about 7 lakh people commit suicide every year and even as we even as we are seated here right now every 40 seconds someone is committing suicide because they don't have hope you know the gospel is not for those who want to live it's for those who no longer want to live like a dead man walking or be yoked to the chains of darkness and sin around them and you know the call to receive this power to have the gift of the holy spirit to be a witness is for everyone the question is do we want to be bold enough to be a witness to the world do we want to be empowered do we want to receive this person in our life or do we want to live knowing um do we want to live being aware that we have this dunamis power power within us or do we want to continue existing as though we don't have any weapon to fight against the spiritual warfare around us are we comfortable feeling stuck in our guilt you know when peter denied christ he knew what he did right at that moment when jesus just looked at him and he wept bitterly because he was filled with that guilt he could have been stuck in that guilt probably returned back to fishing and stopped being a disciple of jesus thinking i'm not worthy to proclaim the truth i'm not worthy to call the name of the lord but what happened 
This is the same Peter whom Jesus used to build the church. And because of that revival that day, today, we are believers here. It was a ripple effect that happened. And if we call ourselves believers and have a part of a church and we say that we have this power of the Holy Spirit within us, and if we have at some point in our life had the conviction to change, repent, testify, and be a witness, then I think we should choose to go forward with that conviction. You know, um, have you ever looked at stagnant water? Why do they say don't keep stagnant water in your house? Because that's the place that can breed mosquitoes and it's contamination. It cannot be consumed or used for what it is meant to be. But when you look at a free-flowing river, it refreshes nature and everything that comes in contact with it. A believer's life can be one of these. We can live without caring about our inward healing, inward restoration, inward revival. Um, just because we repented once, just because we were baptized, um, and um, we name ourselves as Christians. But if we really want to live as real, true, radical, and genuine witnesses, as torchbearers for the kingdom of God, we really need to submit ourselves to Christ, repent, and be filled with the Holy Spirit every day. Um, I'm quoting from R.C. Sproul, who said, repentance is not, for a, not a once and for all event at the beginning of the Christian life. It's a lifelong activity. It's a lifelong attitude and activity. And you know what? We need to go through the cycle of repentance every day, being transformed and cleansed every single day so that we can progress from glory to glory until one day we become truly like him and are received into, this, into his eternal kingdom. But for that, we need to be in tune with God every moment of our day. And it's the Holy Spirit within us that enables us to commune with God, the Father, God the Son, the Holy, God the Son, Jesus Christ. And, you know, um, there's this verse in that passage where Peter says that, repent and be baptized. And many of us, we, we, we kind of focus on that word baptism. It's actually an outward proclamation, outward action to show that, yes, we are turning away from something. But, you know, before that word baptism, there's that word repentance, which starts from within. And there is, there is a huge power in repentance. It's not something that we need to beat ourselves about it. It's actually an empowering tool that God has given us. Repentance and confession. Um, you know, I wanted to have this picture on slide, but I just could not be more creative to illustrate this. Just imagine, you know, you're, you're in a pit. It's deep down. And there is someone up there who's reaching, who's putting their hand down, and they want to just pull you out. And you're trying your best to go up. You're trying your best. But you don't have that power to go up. But, there's that, but there is that power from the bottom that pushes you up, just like that hairdress, hair dryer, that wind which was there below, and pushed that ball up. That's the power of the Holy Spirit. And there is so much power in confession and putting that, you know, when the truth is exposed, there's a power of the Holy Spirit that is unleashed. It's a very simple act, but that very simple act of confession, you know, you don't have to stand up here and confess to everybody. It can happen one-to-one. -one. It can happen in that home groups that you all attend. It can happen with a friend, with a mentor. And when you expose that truth, that truth sets you free. And when, you, when you're free, is that's when you, you make way for the Spirit of God to come in you, empower you. Because that, this that liberates you, it's not just for yourself, you know. When you have that power within you, it's a ripple effect. It just spreads. And so... I just want to end by saying that, uh, you know, the 3,000 believers 
who were together every day. It was with that power of the Holy Spirit which was there in each one of them. Today, what does that mean to us? We may not have that liberty to meet every day, be together, because we all are in different places. Some of us are in Kothanur, K. K Narayanapura, Kamnahali, every wellspringer, not even wellspringer, I would say every body of Christ is spread out. But there's one thing common. The power of the Holy Spirit is within us. The question is, do we want to receive it? And the other question is, if we really have it within us, are we really exercising that power and living like people who have that power within us? Can we stop being okay with being stuck? Can we stop being okay feeling that guilt and living with that? Can we allow the power of the Holy Spirit to be unleashed so that it can just spread out because the world outside, it's too broken, you know. And I'm not saying that all of us who are here um, are great internally and emotionally. All of us break. But there's one difference between someone outside the world and someone who's sitting here. We have a power. We have a helper within us who helps us to stand up when we can't stand. And, and they need to know it. So I just want to leave with this word that can we live like a generation who is empowered and go out there and be people who can just spread this power. The world needs it. The world needs to experience the glory of God, the experience that we are having right today, this Sunday morning. Just want to close with a word of prayer. Spirit of the living God, we know you are here. You've spoken to each one of us here today. You've stirred our hearts, Lord. And maybe some of us are struggling to break those chains that are around us this morning. But today we want to call upon that power that you gave to every believer 2,000 years ago, that power that is there within each one of us today. And I pray that you would make way for us to receive that Holy Spirit. Lord, we want to repent. Lord, we want to turn back. We want to turn away from the things that have stopped us from declaring you as our Lord, that has overshadowed our vision to see you as our Lord, Father. And today I pray that you would open our eyes. You would empower us to be a community who is a light that's not kept under the bush, but a light that reflects your power, your glory. Because there are many people who need you, Lord. And we just want to be used by you. But even before we are used by you, Lord, we want to repent from everything. It may not be an addiction, but it may be something that has not allowed us to see you as our Lord. We want to lay it at your feet. We want to remind ourselves that what you did on that cross 2,000 years ago was not just for the people of Israel, but even for every one of us here. The curse is broken. There's the, the victory over sin and death has already been done by you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' most precious name I pray. Amen. <laughs>